This is a GIS News Hour for Monday, October 17, 2011. I am Abigail McIntyre. Coming up, Tourism Minister promises government's continued commitment to Liat, a decrease in prices at the pump from Tuesday, and government could repossess houses given to people at the Lacalum housing project. We'll tell you why. Stay with us. Culture presents the second annual Anti Tech Spice Wood Festival, Tuesday, October 18th to 23rd, 2011. The festival kicks off with an official launch on October 18th at the St. George's University. On Wednesday, October 19th, a book fair and exhibition will be held at the Public Library featuring Sir Paul Schoon. On Thursday, October 20th, Ms. Verna Wilkins will be featured at a book fair at the Esplanade Mall. On Friday, October 21st, come out to Bathway Beach for Bonfire and Storytelling Night. Showcase your work on October 22nd at the Young Authors Book Fair, Exhibition, Extravaganza and Poetry Slam at the Botanical Gardens. The festival culminates with a grand concert at Fort Matthew. So be a part of this year's Spice Word Festival. Bring your word and come. October 18th to 23rd. For more information, contact the Prime Minister's Ministry on 440-2255 or 440-2265. Look out for build-up events prior to the festival. Welcome back. Without Liat, people in the Caribbean will suffer greatly. That reminder from Tourism Minister and Civil Aviation Minister Peter David as he addressed the start of a week-long workshop for journalists in the Caribbean. The workshop at the Flamboyant Hotel is the second for the year to be organized by Liat and the Caribbean Tourism Organization. The first was held in Tortola in July. Speaking on his government's behalf, Minister David said they will work diligently to ensure that the airline continues to fly in the region. He thanked Liat for its contribution to Caribbean tourism. Tourism, European tourism, American tourism, Canadian tourism is essential. But regional tourism, I think, is something that we must focus on. We in the region, we speak a lot about integration, but we need to do more to get our peoples traveling throughout the region. We have seen in the last couple of years a decline. We say in Grenada, I'm not sure the numbers, how accurate they are, but in a range of 20% decline in regional tourism has affected us greatly. I think we, as journalists in this room, and we as policymakers, must ensure that we do more to encourage travel throughout the region, and to ensure that our people visit each other. Because despite the fact that we are Caribbean people, despite the fact that we have a lot in common, we do have some differences, but some beautiful differences that we must share with each other. 
The airline's corporate communications manager, Mr. Desmond Brown, praised the Liat for its services to the region during its 55 years of existence. Liat, which has an average of more than 100 flights daily, connecting English, Spanish, French, and Dutch-speaking countries in the region, supports civic and community causes and contributes to government coffers. Today, Liat co contributes substantially to the economic and social development of our region moving close to 1 million passengers in 2010 and providing important linkages for inter-regional travel as well as for connections to international, particularly transatlantic travel. In most islands, Liat remains the main carrier, transporting more passengers than any other airline. Some relief for motorists effective Tuesday with a slight decrease in prices at the pump. In Grenada, the price of gasoline will decrease by 60 cents from $15.99 to $14.99. The new price of diesel will be $14.82 and kerosene $11.97. The price of the 20-pound cylinder of cooking gas remains at $47.96 as government continues to to subsidize the cost. Without government's intervention, the price would have been $53.71. As a consequence, government subsidy on each 20-pound cylinder for the next month will be $5.75. On the Sister Isle of Karakou, gasoline will cost $15.15, diesel $14.98, and kerosene $12.14. Government says it will repossess houses given to people at the Lacalum housing project if evidence sure they have not kept the end of the bargain. This was announced by former Senator in the Ministry of Housing, Glenn Noel, during one of government's ongoing town hall meetings. Details in this report. At a town hall meeting in Palmer, St. David last week, government was questioned by residents about the situation at La Colombe. They wanted to know what steps would be taken to deal with the issue of people not occupying houses after it was given to them. In responding, former Minister for Housing, Senator Glenn Noel, said only recently the ministry conducted a survey at the La Colombe housing project to determine the status of people and their homes. He says that there were complaints that some residents who received the houses rarely occupy them and in some cases never did since being handed over the keys. There have been some complaint that a uh, couple persons who got the houses were not actually living in the houses. You had a situation where for example one occupant died and um, relatives were living in the house. You had a situation where someone traveled. As soon as they got the house they traveled and the house was left abandoned. So what we're trying to do is to ascertain exactly what is the situation, how many houses that are not occupied, if so, why, and if there are persons who cheated the system. In other words, we try to put the best foolproof system that we can to ensure persons who really needed the house got the houses. Let us not forget that you had 100 houses, but you had more than 800 persons applying for the house. And therefore, it means one out of every eight persons could have benefited from the house. We're dealing with human beings. A person could come to you and could give you every story about their situation, their needs. Um, they may even get other persons that will back them and say, yes, this person faced this situation. And you may discover later on that it's not true, even though you will have investigated the matter. So I am not perfect. No system is perfect. What I do know, we try our best to ensure that we did the thing in so, with some kind of equity. So if there are a few persons who cheat the system, they're going to be discovered, and the house will be taken back from them if they do not need, if we can get very clear facts that there is no need for the house and they have other source or other place of living, obviously the house will be taken back from them and will be given to persons who are in need.
On another matter, one resident of St. David took issue with government with what he believed was a lack of agriculture education in schools. But he, as well as others attending the meeting, was reassured that the agriculture program in schools is alive and well. Education Minister Senator Frank Bernadine says since assuming office, it became a priority to ensure the subject was well executed in schools nationwide. In fact, about four curriculum officers are designated to deal with agriculture education education in schools. So far, Minister Bernadine added, the curriculum has been successful and students are performing remarkably in the subject area. The CXC passes in agriculture are good. I was sitting here trying to remember this year, it's about 92%. The agricultural passes are excellent compared, and there are large numbers of children sitting there, several hundred. So the evidence indicates that there is good teaching, there is good backup and things are happening. Now, at the primary level, there are also agricultural programs. But what I think happens to us is that having taken it as an academic subject, we don't seem to be able to translate it at all into what grows in the backyard or children, young people don't see it as a way of earning at all. And to me, that is where we are breaking down, because we also have people who go off to do scholarships in agriculture. As I was sitting here tonight, I remember that there are several who went off this year. And there are two or three at the graduate level, research level as well, right at St. Augustine um, University of the West Indies. So, it is there, but it's not translated. This is, this is the trouble. Is how to get them to understand that productivity is not a CXE subject that you do in the school and you grow in a little backyard in the back of the school. Even some of them also have good animal husbandry, plenty room for more. But they do keep, they keep chicken farms. They do these things. I've visited them because I was going to light right out on that agricultural issue and say, this is where we must be producing the children. But the officers do try, and they do have a pretty good program, and their pastors are good, and they're getting them every year. Representatives from the insurance sector in the Eastern Caribbean Currency Union are meeting this week to develop a regional framework for insurance regulation and supervision. The Eastern Caribbean Central Bank, First Initiative and the World Bank are hosting a workshop for stakeholders in the insurance sector in St. Kitts on Tuesday and Wednesday to review the existing regulatory systems and models governing the insurance sector. Details from Tuana Sam. The intention is to harness the views and recommendations of policymakers in constructing a regulatory framework for regulation and supervision of the insurance sector in the Eastern Caribbean Currency Union, ECCU, with a view to making the necessary changes that will assist with offering increased protection to policyholders. Participants will discuss two papers prepared by consultants from the World Bank. The first is the Roadmap for Insurance Supervision in the ECCU, and the second is International Models of Multijudicial Insurance Regulation and Supervision. The workshop is part of the technical assistance provided by the World Bank through the first initiative project, which was initiated after the CLECO and BICO failure. The first initiative project includes strengthening and harmonizing the regulatory and supervisory framework for insurance companies operating in the Eastern Caribbean Currency Union. The findings of the workshop will be presented by the Ministerial Subcommittee on Insurance of the ECCB Monetary Council, chaired by Dr. The Honorable Rav Gonzal, Prime Minister of St. Vincent and the Grenadines. Participants will include members of the Co-Committee on Insurance, Insurance Regulators, insurance association representatives and policy makers. The environment and the proper use of its natural resources are closely linked to the survival of people of particular regions. Environmentalists as well as representatives from local communities in 10 Caribbean countries are here in Grenada for the regional workshop on updating national biodiversity strategies and action plans. They are also launching the UN Decade for Biodiversity. Sakali Okiso, representing the Secretariat on the Convention of Biological Diversity, described the Caribbean as a biodiversity diversity hotspot, noting the number of plant and animal species that can only be found in the region. She explains what the workshop is expected to achieve. 
This capacity building workshop should be seen as a crucial first step towards securing the long-term viability of the biological resources of this truly unique region. Many countries in the Caribbean have already gained substantial experience in developing and implementing national biodiversity strategies and action plans. We now need to draw on this communal experience for time is of the essence. Grenada's Environment Minister, Honorable Joseph Gilbert, who officially launched the UN Decade for Biodiversity, says it cannot be left to government and scientists to make decisions on biodiversity. Communities need to be involved in the process, Minister Gilbert suggests. 2011 was declared the International Year of Forests by the UN to raise awareness and strengthen sustainable forest management. This indeed is quite a noble gesture. But biodiversity will be better served by having 10,000 feet on the ground who are vigilant protectors of their own environment than by, than by hiring 100 wardens to do patrol work. And even if, we were to, even if we were to employ several such wardens in our parks, it is still doubtful that they would ever be able to achieve the desired positive outcome that community-motivated conservation is likely to have on our depleting biodiversity. The minister has commended the work of the local forestry department in protecting Grenada's wildlife from extinction with the implementation of open and closed season for hunting of species such as manicou. Aria St. Louis, head of Grenada's environmental unit, says Grenada will continue to implement measures to protect its biodiversity. Of great concern to us is the fact that there appears to be no easing in the pressures which are leading to the loss of biodiversity. In fact, the GBO3, the Global Biodiversity Outlook 3, warns that biodiversity loss is intensifying as a result of human actions exacerbated by the impacts of climate change. So what is Grenada doing and what are we as a region doing? Well, towards addressing the loss of biodiversity among a number of issues, Grenada has developed a systems plan for parks and protected areas in similar ways to many of the other islands here today. We have recently completed our willingness to pay study and this month will complete our economic valuation of hidden goods and services, which are very important tools for our national development. Recognizing the need for community involvement, Ms. St. Louis says several government and non-government bodies are willing to embark on biodiversity projects. However, they lack the necessary project funding. Ms. St. Louis says one of the plans for accessing funding is collaborating with various international environmental and heritage organizations. You're watching the GIS News Hour. More after the break. Worldwide Grenada invites you to their fifth annual conference, date October 25th, 2011. The theme is It is Time to Seek the Lord. The venue, Open Bible Church, Springs, St. George. Time is 10 a.m. Our guest speaker, Bishop Dave King, on October the 26th at 7 p.m. New Testament Church of God, Lucas Street, St. George. Teaching on submission. For more info, please contact 440-8595 or 410 -6409. This 
Bones for Grenada, Carrier Coon, and Pity Martinique. Get on your marks, set, bingo! On Saturday, Saturday, October 29, 2K11, Ray Sosa National Cricket Stadium to experience the bingo of all bingo! In lane one, sponsored in part by Huggins Automotive, is a brand new 2011 Hyundai Tucson, coupled with an all-inclusive automotive kit, compliments SP's International. In lane two, part sponsored by Digicel, our Caribbean cruise tickets for two, with five hundred dollars spending money. In lane three, compliments Digicel, our two BlackBerry smartphones, and in lane four, twenty thousand dollars in hot cash, compliments the NLA with Clark's Court and Carib. A total of $126,000 in prizes at the starting blocks. And so many ways to win big. big. Car, big. cruise, phones, cash, and cultural entertainment from Grenada's top artists and much more. Brought to you by the National Lotteries Authority. Tickets are only $50. So everybody tell somebody and race on out to the National Cricket Stadium on Saturday, 29th October. October. 18 or older to participate. Remember, when you play bingo with the NLA, you are supporting sports, culture, and nation-building initiatives. Welcome back to the broadcast. Total Visitor Satisfaction, TVS, that is the aim of a CTO project that will certify members of the 33-strong CTO grouping. Secretary General of the Caribbean Tourism Organization, Hugh Riley, says the project will focus on user friendliness and other factors and participating destinations within the grouping will be awarded TVS. Visitors will determine how the countries perform. Addressing journalists at the start of a week-long workshop at the Flamboyant Hotel, Riley said as the world's most tourism-dependent region, the Caribbean must lead in the area of visitor satisfaction and we must care more. Sooner or later, sooner or later, consumers, the travel trade, the media, everyone will start to look around the world for destinations that are paying attention to visitor satisfaction. You know how the green economy has become so major now and there are clients now looking for destinations with that little insignia in the corner that says that they're paying attention to the environment? This is going to happen too. There will be a time when people start to look for destinations that are in the tourism industry that are paying attention to delivering the kind of experience that visitors are paying for. And there is no region in the world that's doing this yet. And there's no reason why the Caribbean can't lead on it. Director of Tourism Simon Steele says they are happy to be part of the training because of the importance of tourism, which contributes 25% to the country's GDP. He said the subject matters, journalism ethics, structured clarity and accuracy in news reporting and crime, and crisis disaster reporting are critical. How we report on incidents, negative in incidents. Again, there is a need to be truthful. There is a responsibility to report what is going on. But it's important that that is done in a very balanced and a very, very objective way. And anything that we here in Grenada, as your hosts this week, can do to help sensitize and provide you with those tools to write in a balanced and objective way, again, we are fully supportive of. Meanwhile, Tourism Minister Peter David said tourism is the number one industry in the region, but this has not seeped into the consciousness of all the territories. As a result, he said journalists need to help people understand the important link between tourism and all the other sectors of an economy. Our agricultural sector, our construction sector, all of these sectors must not be seen in competition with tourism but must be seen as complementary to tourism. Our farmers must export their products to our hotels. Our contractors will get work when we build hotels. Our banks 
give mortgages to employees in the tourism sector. All of our sectors are integrally linked into the tourism sector. And therefore, you as journalists must yourselves understand that so that in your own reporting, while you do report the truth, you do report the facts, you bear in mind in your own consciousness that you are reporting on the most important industry in the region. Not just simply seeing it on the board and you know 20%, 25%, 30% GDP, but you believe it, you know it, and you feel it, the importance of industry, of this industry, to all of our lives. In 2009, Liad began a strategic relationship with the Caribbean Tourism Organization to provide training for media practitioners in the Caribbean. This is the second year. The first was held in Tortola in July. The Food and Agriculture Organization is calling for greater policy coordination in the international food trade in order to reduce instability in maintaining the flow of goods. This was highlighted by policy advisor in the Ministry of Agriculture, Ferran Lowe, as he delivered the FAO Director General's message during last Friday's World Food Day activity. This year's World Food Day activity was held under the theme Food Prices from Crisis to Stability. In addressing the issue, FAO Director General Dr. Jacques Duff stated that one of the major contributing factors to high food prices is policy differences in international food trade. He says his organization also supports the elimination of trade distortion in agriculture subsidies in rich countries. While this may not trigger price movements, it could influence the size and duration of it. it in addressing the matter of food prices, the Director General recommends fair and transparent trading as one way in stabilizing prices. At the World Food Day activity last Friday, policy advisor in the Ministry of Agriculture, Ferran Lowe, delivered the Director General's address to mark the occasion. More and better information is needed to allow greater transparency in trade or futures market. This would help ensure that governments and traders make informed decisions and avoid panic or irrational reactions. As to mitigating the effects of volatility on the poor, national or regional safety nets, possibly featuring emergency food reserves, can help assure food supplies to the needy during crisis. Poor consumers can also be assisted with cash or food vouchers and farmers helped with inputs such as fertilizer and seeds. Various financial mechanisms can help governments protect consumers from food price increases. One example is called options, which would give governments the right to buy food at set price even months ahead, regardless of how the market has moved in the meantime. Ultimately though, Stability in the food market depends on increased investment in agriculture, particularly in developing countries where 98% of the hungry live and where food production needs to be doubled by 2050 to feed growing populations. If some of these recommendations are not taken seriously by governments, the Director General warns that small countries will continue to feel the effects of high food prices. At the level of net food importing countries, price rises can hurt poor countries by making it much more expensive for them to import food for their people. Farmers are also affected because they badly need to know months away the price their crops will fetch at harvest time. If high prices are likely, they plant more. If low prices are forecast, they plant less and cut costs. Rapid price swings make that calculation much more difficult. World Food Day is used by the FAO to highlight the plight of the 862 million unnourished people worldwide. A World Bank report showed that during the period 2010 to 2011, the rising cost of food forced near 700 million to extreme poverty. Acting Permanent Secretary in the Ministry of Agriculture, Anne-Marie Marichaud, says last Friday's event promotes the use of local production for survival. Our exhibits today by our farmers showcases the capability of our farmers 
to curb this problem. It further demonstrates to you, our consumers, that agriculture has a major role to play in ensuring the crisis in food prices is stabilized. Your presence here today is a clear indication of your support and commitment in ensuring food security, food reserves, and a reverse in the demand and supply cycle. Acting Agriculture Minister Glenn Noel says government has been doing its part to ensure increased production locally. We at the Ministry of Agriculture, through our policy direction, recognizing that agriculture would continue to be a main pillar of the economy. Over the years, have been experiencing tremendous growth in the production of root crop. We can see all over Grenada, and today you can see as part of the exhibition, the abundance of fresh fruits and vegetables. And this is by no means an accident. It has a lot to do with the policy direction of the Ministry of Agriculture to provide support and encouragement to our farmers to continue to produce more. Recently, ladies and gentlemen, we experienced in Grenada a shortage of banana, and in fact, we had to import banana as far away as Suriname. We can proudly state now that we have amended this situation, and today we are at a situation where some farmers are preparing to export banana once again. So I think the Ministry of Agriculture and the farmers must be given a round of applause for the effort in stabilizing the situation and getting us once again involved in that important staple. The message of constitutional reform is being taken to the Sister Owls this week. Constitution reform is a process by which the constitution of a country is revised or changed. This process usually involves consultations with its citizens. The Constitution Review Commissions, which reported in 1985 and 2006, and which was the result of widespread consultations, recommended changes to the Grenada Constitution to strengthen the foundation of the governing institutions of Grenada. Robert Branch of the Attorney General's Office says, among others, the revised draft being presented to the people recommends a unicameral instead of bicameral chamber in Parliament. This means there will be one chamber with all members being fully elected and fully accountable to the people. As it stands now, Parliament is divided into an upper and lower house. This recommendation is to en enhance our democracy by m making this body now um, have a, a, that chamber fully elected and therefore all the, the ministers and the representatives in that chamber would be fully accountable to the people. Because as you are aware now, um, based on the present um, arrangement we have, we have the, the law house where we have um, 15 elected members and then we have 13 nominated members, um, seven by the prime minister, um, three again by the prime minister after consultation with the special interest groups and then the opposition has um, three persons in the Senate. But, but the new arrangement we recommend again, this new unicameral system, we'll have a chamber that's fully elected. So you'll have the, the 15 persons being elected on the first pass the post system, and then the others will be elected on, a, on the basis of the proportion of um, the, the electorate or the proportion of votes that each party will have gotten in that election. So it becomes fully elected. We, we haven't exactly determined, for example, um, um, what percentage of, of seats a party will have to get first before they're entitled to have members in that house. So it's something, it's a mathematical issue that will have to be worked out eventually. But so, for example, uh, a situation that occurred in Grenada in 1999, where you had one political party, that was the, the new national party winning 15 seats, but it was only 40 something percentage of the votes. So then you had all those people who voted for the NDC had no representation in parliament. But if this occurs under the new system, um, the NNP would then, uh, if, if that system had existed, the NNP would have gotten the, the 15 seats, but then you would have had additional seats. So they would have had some members being appointed based on the percentage of votes that they got, and the NDC would have had a percentage based on the 
the percentage of, of votes that they got in the election. Five sessions will be held on the islands. There will be two town hall meetings, one at the P.T. Martinique RC School from 4.30 p.m. on Wednesday afternoon and another at Bishop's College in Karakou from 5 p.m. on Thursday afternoon. There will also be sessions with Form 4 and 5 students of the two secondary schools, Bishop's College and Hillsborough Secondary, as well as students in the higher forms in the primary schools. That's news. Sports is next with Trevor Thwaites. Stay with us. online at your favorite stores around the world and your package will be delivered to your doorstep right here in Grenada. The Grenada Postal Corporation brings you closer to the rest of the world with GPC Global. GPC Global is a new, exciting, and cost-effective service. For less than $20 US, you can have your own personal mailbox in the US and off you go shopping. You can view your shipment as it moves 24-7 with up-to-the-minute tracking. Make your purchase and GPC Global will do the rest, even customs clearance. We make it easy and hassle-free. GPC Global, the world at your fingertips. Dependable, reliable, and safe. My book. I did it. I did it. Come and look at what I've done. I read a book when someone wrote it long ago for me to read. How did he know that this was the book I'd take from the shelf, lie on the floor, and read by myself? I really read it, just like that, word for word, from first to last. Cause this book's gonna be a good book. Cause this book's gonna be a good book. Grenada fails in its attempt to qualify for a 2014 World Cup Finals in Brazil. Eleven teams competing in the 2011 GCIC Intersectors Netball Tournament, which began on Saturday, over $22,000 US dollars up for grabs in the 2011 trans Demuel OCS South Marathon here next, in the next two weeks, and India take a 2 0 lead in the five-match one-day series against England at home. This is another GIS Sports. Hello, I'm Trevor Thwaites. Uh, first off, football and Grenada has failed in its attempt to qualify for 2014 FIFA World Cup Finals in Brazil. This after drawing one all in the return fixture against St. Vincent and the Grenadines on Saturday in St. George's. After losing the opening matches to Belize and St. Vincent and the Grenadines, Grenada revived its hope with uh, a convincing 4-1 win in the return fixture against Belize two weeks ago in Belmopan. They then did to win their remaining three matches against St. Vincent and the Grenadines and Guatemala to remain in contention for a place in the next round. But the one-all draw on Saturday means that the Spice Boys must not play for pride and attempt to lift their FIFA rankings. St. Vincent and Grenadines struck a well-taken goal by Marion Samuel in the 62nd minute. Good goal indeed from a great build-up. Grenada replied through Clive Murray in extra time from a free kick just outside the 18-yard box. It was a disappointing result for fans and coach Nat Simpson, who said that Grenada gave up way too many uh, possessions. I really thought this evening that we were going to get a public exhibition of good ball possession and maintenance, and 
that didn't come through today. We, we turned it over way, way too much from the beginning till probably the end of the game. But it's not, it's not lost. Um, you wanted to go, go into this World Cup, but uh, you, might be, you might be looking beyond the World Cup, trying to build a team for the next one. Where do you go from here? Well, I can go, I'm going to tell you, we're going to go to Guatemala on the 11th and the 15th, and that's what and after is up to the FA, you know, what they do way forward from there. Um, any thoughts on the results against Guatemala? Well, again, we're going to try to go and win against Guatemala in Guatemala City. Grenada, once we go out there, we're going with the intention to win. And that's what we're going to do come the 11th of November and see if we could actually make some amends for two what we thought subpar performances in front of the Grenadian public. We have to come up with one. National soccer coach Nat Simpson. There was also a bit of a disappointment at the St. Vincent and Grenadians camp after they conceded in extra time. English coach Colwyn Rowe was distraught at taking his team through the paces for such a free kick. We practiced defending that set piece every day ten times. We put someone on the near post, and I know who it is, and he's not there! Unbelievable! Unbelievable! I'm so disappointed now, so it's difficult, but if, if, if I'm honest, I think, I think in, 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 I mean, I don't know, but the possession stats, I would say that probably Grenada might have shaded it on chances and good positions with, with one hand, and we should 6-2, six, 6-3, six, I don't know, you tell me. Um, yeah, you're right, there you are. Where does the result leave you in terms of advancing? Can you make it? No, 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 but we're a very, very, very young team, and, and really, if we're, we're looking beyond this World Cup, so... I still was very disappointed, you know, I was disappointed. Coach of the St. Vincent and Grenadines national soccer team, Englishman Colwyn Rowe. Guatemala will most certainly win the group and qualify for the next round of the competition, having played unbeaten so far in four matches. In more football news, Sky Hurricanes and Punknoy United are the latest teams to advance to the top 16 of the Wagi T Super Knockout Football Tournament. They scored wins last weekend to to stake their claim and intention for the major prize of $25,000. Hurricanes, the former GFA Premier League champions from St. Mark's, outplayed Feta Boys from Hermitage for gold to nil. They led 1-0 at the interval and piled on the pressure in the second period, outpassing and outclassing their opponents. Carl Joseph opened the scoring in the 24th minute, and Raquel Augustin increased the lead in the 47th with a right foot shot from just outside the 18-yard box. Benson George then scored the most brilliant goal of the weekend to make it 3-0. He collected the ball just outside the 18-yard box, dribbled past three players before slotting a left footer into the roof of the net. Kenwell Batiste completed the route in the 59th minute to crown a profound domination by the former Premier League champions. Functional United also announced their presence with an emphatic 6-0 win over m &N Alliance of St. David. They led 2-0 at the interval and really upped the tempo in the second half. Raymond Aline started the route in the 26th minute with a powerful shot from 25 meters out which slipped through the legs of the goalkeeper. Well, that's his hands and legs. Royal Andrew made it 2-0 in the 32nd minute and Clinton Jones struck twice, first in the 44th and later in the 88th minute, the 80th minute as Function I took firm control. Nairon Rudrup then headed in front Heading in from a Raymond Aline corner in the 59th minute, and Kendall Charles rifled a, a right footer from just inside the 18 yard box in the 6th or 7th minute for the other. The event continues Friday and Saturday with another four matches. Several exhibition games were part of the highlights of the opening of the 2011 Intersectors Netball Tournament on Saturday at the Tantine Courts. Some six exhibition games were played off among the players of the 11 teams competing in the competition. Players used the games to further fine-tune their preparation for the competition. Games were played off on Tuesdays, Thursdays and Fridays with the competition matches starting on Tuesday, that's tomorrow. The partner sports is the defending Intersectors netball champions. In athletics, uh, 2,100 US dollars are for the taking in the 2011 trans Nemville Half Marathon on Sunday, October 30th in St. George's. Runners from Grenada and the Eastern Caribbean will compete in the 13-mile course, which takes them through Cherry Hill, Melville Street, Granby Street, Halifax Street, Young Street, 
the Carnage, Tantin, Paddock, Springs, Woodlands, Grandans Valley, the Morris Bishop Highway, back through Grandans, Belmont, Lagoon Road, Port Highway, and onto the Carnage. Cast prizes are earmarked for the top male and female finishers who will collect 1,000 US dollars each. The runners up in both the male and female divisions who get $500 US dollars each. Those finishing third will receive 300 US dollars, four, 200 US dollars, and fifth, the finishers, the fifth place finishers in both the divisions getting 100 US dollars each. Trophies are also earmarked for the oldest male and female finishers, youngest male and female uh, finishers, and male and female teams completing the course. That's all happening in the next two weeks. In cricket, India have gone 2 0 up in the five match one day series against England at home. They won the second game on Monday by an emphatic eight wickets. England batted first and were dismissed for 237 in a 48.2 overs. V. Kumar, that Vinay Kumar, took 4 for 30 from 9 overs, and Yadav had 2 for 50 from 8.2 overs. Peterson scored 46, Patel 42, Bopara 37, uh, Trot 34, and Biasso 35 for England. India were powered by brilliant centuries from Virat Kohli, who scored an unbeaten 112, Gatam Gambier, who was undefeated on 84. So India making the early run-ins in the five-match one this series against England, leading 2-0 after two games. South Africa produced an astonishing comeback to beat Australia by three wickets. Yeah, by three wickets in Johannesburg and leveled the 2020 series one game apiece. Australia scored 147 for eight with skipper Cameron White scoring 39. Teenager Pat Cummins took two for 36, or make that 26. And he struck early as South Africa had slumped to 84 for seven and seemed in desperate trouble. But Tillenders Wayne Purnell, 29 from 11 balls, and Rusty Theron, a newcomer, 30 from 16 balls, smashed South Africa to victory. Australia won the opening game uh, three days ago by uh, three wickets. The teams continued their duel on Wednesday with the first of a three-match one-day series at the Centurion Park. They are also getting ready to contest a three-match uh, test series. And of course, the West Indies continued their battle against Bangladesh in the uh, series in Bangladesh, the third and final one day international taking place from 3 o'clock uh, uh, Tuesday morning. The West Indies looking to complete a clean sweep. That's sports. I'm Trevor Thwaites. a student of the Beacon High School. Do you know what you should do during a hurricane? Allow me to share a few tips with you. Listen constantly to your local radio station or television for hurricane progress reports. Keep a supply of flashlights, extra batteries, and bulbs at hand. Avoid candles and kerosene lamps. Stay inside, away from windows, skylights and glass doors and remember do not panic hi i am kim Gale, a student of the st joseph's convent st george's do you know that the hurricane season runs from june 1st to november 30th hurricanes are known for the destructive winds storm surges, and heavy rainfall, which may cause flooding. Therefore, it is important to keep all drains and streams clean from debris at all times. Prepare your home and all supplies well in advance. Protect your loved ones before, during, and after the hurricane. Assist your family, neighbors, and community. Let us ensure that Grenada is a safe place before, during, and after the hurricane.
Thank you, Trevor, with this evening's sports segment recapping the main points in tonight's news. Tourism Minister promises government's continued commitment to Liat. A decrease in prices at the pump from Tuesday. And government could repossess houses given to people at the Lakalum housing project. We gave you details on that story as well. On behalf of the entire team here at the Government Information Service, I am Abigail McIntyre. Thank you for joining us. You're watching the Government Information Service, channels 12 and 22.